Uh, welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 17th of May, 2018, and we have a special guest here today, Julian Kraus from yeah. Frankfurt. Hi. Yeah, yeah, Frankfurt, Germany. Yeah, very good. That's right. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a little bit later at your on uh, your end there, but uh, you very kindly agreed to come on, so thanks for that. Today we're going to talk a little bit about noise in uh, audio, and specifically what we're going to call self-noise. And I want to make sure that we make a, a clear distinction here. So Julian, from your point of view, when you think of self-noise, what's, what's kind of the definition of self-noise in an audio signal chain? Yeah, so for me, it's more the noise that is created from the equipment itself. So that's not the ambient sounds you get into your microphone or that you can avoid in any um, way in placing your microphone, for example. It's like the inherent sound that is just present in the equipment itself. That's the, the so-called self-noise. And there are actually multiple stages or um, where self-noise exists. It can be like in microphones, preamps, A2D converters, and this stuff adds up. And then in the end, you have the, the combined noise floor that is present in your recording. Okay, very good. Uh, and uh, I, the reason I asked that is that I actually saw one of your videos. I'm going to just kind of pull that up on my end here. You won't see it there, but... Um, I'm just pointing to your video called The Preamp Shootout, Sound mm -hmm. Devices Mix Pre versus Zoom, FH versus Rode versus Roland. Um, and that was a really yeah. interesting piece from the standpoint that um, you you were looking specifically at preamplifier self-noise. So but mm -hmm. before we move to that and talk about that as our main subject today, I want to talk a little bit about um, the other places where we're most likely to pick up self noise in your experience, what are those? Is that is that the microphone? Is it the A to D, A to D converter or you know preamplifier? How much of each of those parts make up the self noise generally? Uh, that's actually um, you have to discern a little bit between, for example, if you're recording with dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. This is very important because um, if you use dynamic microphones usually the most self-noise in your chain is going to be from your preamps. So that's in your recording device because of the very low sensitivity from the dynamic microphone itself and the low self-noise of the dynamic mic. Um, when you're recording with um, condenser microphones, on the other hand, then it's a little bit the opposite, uh, yeah, the opposite way around because um, yeah, typically the noise floor you're going to hear if you hear any noise then it's typically from the mic itself and it's not a problem um, yeah, from the preamp or the A to D converter, for example. So it's a little bit dependent on which type of mic you use. Okay. Uh, so I guess one question on that that I've actually been kind of curious about myself is that if you have various, you have various devices in the audio signal chain, um, if the preamplifier is making, say for example, you're working with a condenser microphone, it's making a little bit of noise, a condenser mic is making perhaps a little bit more noise. Is it additive mm -hmm. or does this just mask out the um, the noise um, that the preamp is yeah, making? Yeah, it's, it's kind of additive. It's 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 a little bit tricky. It's um, if you combine noise, that's a, um, an, a uh, how to explain it? It's an addition, but uh, the signals are uncorrelated signals because they, they, are, they are not coherent, not correlated, these signals. And when you add these together, then they will add up when you have two equal uh, noises with equal ampl amplitude and you will add them together, then you end up with a signal that is three decibels higher. For example, you have a microphone that has the same amount of no noise than a preamp and you put both these um, signals together, then you end up with a noise law that is three decibels higher. So it's a little bit more complicated, It's not, like, but... Yeah, and when you have very, very small amount of noise from one equipment type, for example, the microphone, and you have a very high amount of noise from your preamp, for example, then the noise of the microphone does not really matter at all because the, the noise of the, the preamp is already so high that yeah, the other noise gets drowned completely. Okay, okay. That makes sense. Um, so one of the things that um, I saw also was another video that you have more recently posted, which talked about your your method for actually testing uh, the self noise of preamplifiers. So one of the things that you did in that in your recent video is you talked a little bit about these uh, XLR connectors that you use here. So this one, for example, is shorted between pins two and three. It doesn't have anything mm -hmm. else connected to it. Um, same with this one, except in this case there is a 150 ohm 
resistor between pins two and three. And so these are yeah. just simulate different types of situations. If, if you wouldn't mind talking about that, I guess, um, is, does it make sense to talk about this or do you need to talk about the overall process for measuring preamplifier, preamplifier self noise? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's okay. You can go over it a little bit more quickly, but uh, yeah, to, I mean, the stuff is quite complex. Uh, we don't want to deep dive that much. Um, but um, yeah, generally speaking, I mean, these two connectors serve two different purposes. Um, one has, yeah, like you said, the 150 ohms metal film resistor across pin two and three, and the other one's just sorted, uh, shorted. And essentially the 150 ohms resistor plug mimics a dynamic microphone. So essentially this, when you plug it into a sound recording device, this is essentially like plugging in a dynamic microphone with 150 ohms impedance. And then the preamp in your device will behave like you would have plugged in a dynamic mic. But um, of course the resistor on its own, it produces noise. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's a given. The, the resistor has a given noise that it will produce, but there is no like ambient noise uh, that you get into your recording, which you would get when you would test with a yeah dynamic microphone. So it's essentially like a perfect dynamic microphone. It's just the the noise floor of a dynamic mic with one hundred fifty ohms, and you don't get any ambient sound into it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yep. yep. And then what about the um. A couple of things. So they, they, you also have the one where you're just shorted between pins two and three. And yeah. I, uh, something I've seen a lot too is that people will say, well, I didn't plug any microphone in and I just tested it that way. But there's a problem with that as well, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big problem actually. Because um, microphone preamps, um, they the noise floor of them depend on... Um, first of all, let's clarify a little bit. Uh, microphone preamps have two different types of noise, and that's actually voltage noise and current noise. And I actually always thought that yeah, a preamp has yeah, well, always one type of noise, and it's a given how much it is. But it's actually the voltage noise is pretty much a given, and this is specific to a preamp. But the um, current noise depends on the impedance you connect to this preamp. So. This means that actually the, the noise flow of a preamp can change quite a bit um, depending on the impedant, you, impedance you connect to this preamp. So depending on the microphone you use and depending on its impedance, the preamp noise can vary quite a bit. And that's actually, that brings me a little bit back to your connector, the 150 ohm connector. That's more like a standard that everybody like fairly agreed to. In Germany, we usually use like 200 ohms, so it's, yeah, it's a little it's close to 150, but it's not 150. And uh, but in the real world, um, dynamic microphones not always have 150 ohms impedance. Yeah, they can have higher, lower, not usually, but uh, yeah. And so it varies quite a bit. So plugging this in will only give you like a rough indication. That's that's what you really have to keep in mind. This is. Yeah, because the, the preamp noise can really change with the impedance, so that's a problem. And the the other plug that's actually shorting the preamp, that's um, essentially eliminating completely the current noise, because shorting the preamp, then you end up only with the voltage noise. So when you do this measurement, you only get the voltage noise of the preamp, which is usually, that's like again, usually, the dominant source of noise in, in the preamp when working with the low impedance sources, but yeah. So yeah, you have to distinguish the what you measure and what you get out of it, how to interpret it is quite a bit different. So yeah, shorting the preamp will actually give you simply um, yeah, the voltage noise. So that's the pure voltage noise of the, the amplifier, putting a 150 ohms resistor across it will mimic a dynamic microphone on the um, preamp and will result in that amount of noise. And then to come back to your point, um, testing uh, the preamp with nothing connected at all is really, really bad because then this is like a really high impedance connected essentially to the amplifier, uh, to the preamp. And this drives up the noise and will give a noise flow which is nothing you will get uh, in the real world because when you connect a microphone anytime any kind of microphone 
it's usually a very low impedance source. So connecting nothing at all is a very unrealistic scenario and will give you a noise floor that's nowhere close to real world use, real world use. So that's not useful at all. Yeah. yeah. I, I've actually heard several people with when they first got their sound devices mixed pre, they turned the knob all the way to the top or the zoom, yeah, you know, whatever, yeah. and they say, Oh my gosh, this is very noisy. I thought I was paying for a much better device than this. <laughs> yeah, and I mean the, the noise floor can go up like 12 decibels or so that's not a problem at all and then yeah you wonder why it's so noisy but when you connect the microphone all of a sudden it's quiet yeah yeah okay um so that's so that's very interesting so then moving on to um the comparison you did you compared a variety of devices a zoom f8 uh mix pre i don't remember if it's the three or the six um a zoom h5 and i think a roland audio interface um, we'll, of course, link to that so people can go watch that in more detail and also link to the video where you talk about the specific method you use to do the yeah. comparison. But what were your overall findings? Yeah, my findings were actually that um, they are... So I measured the stuff. Uh, that's the the so-called equivalent input noise. That's the measurement you make to um, with this 150 ohms resistor connected to the preamp um, to yeah determine how much noise you will roughly get when a dynamic mic is connected to the preamplifier. And yeah, I measured the, yeah, the, yeah like the, the Mix Pre 3 actually, a, the Zoom devices and uh, some interfaces. And I was really astonished that, that the, these measurements really reflected the real world um, performance quite well, because from what I have, um, yeah, I've worked with them quite a lot, and yeah, this this was also my experience with these devices. And yeah, just to cut it short, the Mixpre three actually actually has the the lowest noise preamps, so it's actually quite good. But that's uh, the the Zoom F four and F eight also are pretty close behind, so they are also really really good. And I think in real world use between the Mixpre series and the Zoom F series, very hard to to find a difference there it's like only like two decibels in noise and uh, i was also quite surprised that the rode ai um, ai1 audio interface that this uh, audio interface i mean it costs like 100 something dollars and it is it is really really good i mean the the preamp performance was on par with the zoom f series devices which is absolutely fantastic and then I had another audio interface, which was okay. And then in the end, the Zoom H5, which is still okay and usable. But uh, yeah, um, I mean, the preamps are not nearly as great as like the Mix Pre series, for example. Right. And and when we're talking about the differences here too, you're, you're sort of ranking them. But in reality, um, the differences, especially for example, between the Mix Pre and the Zoom F series was you're talking about two de decibels difference, but also that is overall an equivalent input noise of minus, was it a hundred and, I can't remember the exact number, was it minus a hundred and something? Yeah, minus 129 or something, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Really low, yeah. So at that But it, this is not, this is not to be confused with, this is not the, the amount of noise you will end up in your recording. That's, that's like, don't think that, okay, the equivalent input noise is like minus 129 dBU, then in the end, I will have a noise floor that's at minus 929 dB. That's that's not the case. It really depends on, yeah, how you turn up your gain and mic placement, everything. Yeah. Right. And of course, on top of all that, you're going to have your ambient sound and noise in the actual yeah, space where you do definitely, the recording. Yeah. But comparative to each other, I mean, you these numbers are very very good because you know, okay, uh, if we had a, a dynamic mic, then. With the Mix Pre series, I would have roughly two decibels less noise than with the Zoom F series. If you're going to hear this in the real world, that's that's the whole different story. But yeah. So here's a very very difficult question. I don't know if you can actually answer this, but I'll be curious tried, to yeah. see. <laughs> um, is is a Zoom H5? If 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 I'm getting started in sound for film, and the only thing I can afford is a Zoom H5, can I make good recordings? Definitely, absolutely. And I can say that with 100% confidence because right now I'm using a Zoom H5 as a recorder. And yeah, uh, if you're hearing this back, so then uh, yeah, you will hear the sound of a Zoom H5 um, recording this right now. So noise floor is 
typically not an issue from from a standpoint of the preamp side uh, when you use like condenser microphones that what i that yeah what's a what i told in the beginning when you have when you use dynamic microphones you usually have to turn up the gain pretty high and then you introduce the the noise floor of the preamp and yeah if you do have a zoom h5 for example you will get problems when you use dynamic microphones. I mean, if you had a dynamic mic very close to your mouth talking into it, it might work, but you usually end up with yeah, a, a hissy noise floor. But on the other hand, if you use condenser microphones and f usually if you do v um, audio for video stuff, then pretty much most of the time you're using condenser microphones, or at least I do. And uh, then you don't actually have this problem because the noise floor of the Zoom H5 is low enough that you don't really have to care about it in real world use. So the the difference when using a condenser microphone between a Zoom H5 and a MixPre 3, simply talking about preamp noise is not nearly, it's, it's like negligible. You don't have to worry about it at all. The, the noise performance of an H5 is totally fine for condenser microphones. Okay, very good. And just to clarify for those that are new to the recording world, condenser microphones, we're talking about shotgun microphones or condenser microphones, any sort of boom microphone, non-shotgun um, are also condenser microphones. And in fact, most lavaliers that we use are condenser microphones as well. So yeah. those are all good things. Now, I just want to make sure we put things into perspective here. We talk about noise, a lot. once we, we get into recording, we start talking about noise, but noise performance is not the only uh, thing that we should really probably evaluate when we're considering which microphones and which um, preamplifiers or recorders and things of that nature to use. From your point of view, what are some other things to to watch for or listen to? Yeah, well, actually, um, when using condenser microphones, it's important to have a microphone which has a very low noise floor because then most of the times your overall noise performance and when we're talking about self noise right now, so it's not ambience and stuff like that, purely self noise. When you use condenser microphones, you're typically limited by the noise floor of the microphone itself. So if you go shopping for a microphone, then make sure that you buy one which has yeah, a low noise floor. That's really beneficial to the overall uh, noise floor in your recording because that's actually the microphone does um, provide the yeah, the, the main or is the main contributor to the noise floor overall if you're uh, using a condenser microphone. So yeah, if you're using a condenser mic, make sure that the mic is really low noise and then you will be fine. Okay, very good. And I think it's important to say too, there are other thing, other factors when you're choosing a microphone as well. So for example, the character of the pickup or the polar pattern is very important as well. I think the... Yeah. Um, you especially see with things like shotgun microphones where at different frequencies, the off-axis uh, response seems to change fairly dramatically. And mm -hmm. so... Yeah, that's with large uh, diaphragm condenser microphones, for example, change quite dramatically in the high frequency area when you go off-axis. Yeah. Yep. And that, um, e even with shotgun microphones, I've noticed that in some, um, the, the less yeah. expensive de designs as you get off... And, and the reason that's important is not that you're going to be miking someone off axis but the the things that the sound sources that are off axis will start to sound very unnatural and so that's just something to consider as well yeah they sound muffled yeah essentially yeah muffled and yeah they lose a lot of high frequency so um there are of course other things as well prox you know how much proximity effect a different different mics have if you're going to be working in very close is another factor that's important the overall frequency response which which, which I guess this is an off topic, but I, I'm curious about your thoughts on this as well. So when you yeah, see a frequency sure. response chart, the graph where you you know you kind of see how a microphone yeah. responds, how useful is that when you're just looking at purchasing a mic, but you're not actually hearing the mic? Yeah, well, um, that's that's actually what I'm I want to make a, a YouTube series about because I I want to talk about um yeah about uh, how really to read the the specifications from the manufacturer and how to understand them. I mean, it's always these frequency charts are nice, nice to have, nice to look at. But um, let's say for for the majority of uh, microphones, it won't won't tell you anything because it usually only shows you like the on-axis frequency re response. 
you do not get any kind of off-axis frequency response graph. So, and the the off-axis um, frequency response quite heavily um, shapes the sound because you always get reflections. For example, if you're inside, then and you're not record or usually not recording in anechoic chambers, so you always get reflections and these come in at different angles to the microphone and depending on how the frequency response is um, from the off axis this can change the sound quite dramatically so how a microphone sounds and how you can just look at the graph and see the frequency response in my experience is does not add up at all it's just uh, you can look at it but it not even would give you a rough indication it's just it's just there, but uh, it's not really helpful. At least, um, yeah, the common um, frequency response charts. I mean, there are, if you go to DPA or Sheps, for example, they public um, um, their charts, which they measured. And these are really, really detailed and uh, from different angles. And uh, yeah, this really explains everything. And you can get a good feeling how the microphone sounds from these measurements. But nearly, nearly no manufacturer is like um, yeah, able to, or they don't even want to publish these charts. So yeah, usually they're not really useful. I've noticed a lot of them seem to do a lot of averaging, so the the, the yeah, response heavy is, averaging, is, yeah. is curved and it looks very beautiful and smooth. It's like <laughs> over one one octave smoothing or something like that. That's okay. Yeah, and and probably the most uh, that I've seen uh, is they take. Um, I think some of the Shure microphones do this, which we don't use quite as much in film production, but they will also sometimes show um, proximity, different graphs for proximity versus yeah, not yeah. so close. So that, that's a little bit helpful, but you're right. I think that there's so much there's so much information that's not really explained or, or provided when they when it's just the very simple single single line, single curve uh, frequency response chart. So that's good. One last, uh, I guess, one last thing, Julian. And again, thank you so much for your time. Is what? Um, yeah, sure. What are some of the other things to um, consider? So, for example, there there is sometimes coloration in in preamplifiers and microphones. What what's your advice to people when they go to go shopping for preamplifiers or microphones? What? How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, so the coloration actually, in my opinion, is mainly on the the microphone side. If you have really decent preamps and actually not, you don't have to have like the crazy high end stuff. It's these days technology has come really, really far. Uh, like I said, the, the audio interface, face, the, the road AI one or so in it justly, just speaking about noise performance, this thing is really, really great. And, and it's cheap. Yeah? This, this shows that technology just advances and maybe at some point we don't even have to worry about noise anymore completely but uh yeah um so and coloration that's for me coloration is something so essentially you have a signal you want to record and then you end up with a signal that's not not nearly the same or that's closely matching but it's not 100 percent what you recorded and that's coloration so an altering of the recorded signal and to be honest a preamp or the A to D converter, for example, which is behind the preamp, which is which is digitizing the the analog um, uh, voltages coming from the the preamp, um, they do have some sort of coloration, but these days actually it's so minute, and I I could make a blind test, and I would bet you like nobody could tell a a recording made with a Zoom H five and a mix pre-series apart. If you had like the same microphone or the same signal going to, into both of these recorders and you would play them back to different people, I will bet 100% that nobody can tell a different difference. So that's like coloration, yeah, it might be there, but it's on a level that's very, very, very small. So I personally think coloration is more a problem of the microphone itself. So when you want to have a microphone, that um, does not have any coloration well then you want to have a look at microphones that are built to have like flat flat frequency responses not only on axis like also off axis as well and um, yeah and usually the higher 
um, yeah, or the more you pay, then the more you get for your money. That's like always the stuff. So the the higher end microphones tend to be more natural, but yeah, sometimes I mean there are some Neumann microphones, the the like U eighty something. Um, they are still made. They are quite expensive, and they do not want to be like transparent microphones. They they do not have they they want to shape your sound in in a certain way and. For some people that's good and uh, they want that and some other people really don't want it and in the end you have to decide for yourself which kind of guy are you yeah do you like a microphone that is shaping your sound and if you like the sound then it's okay then you can work with that or do you rather want to have a microphone which is yeah more neutral and then you can shape it maybe a little bit in post if you want and um, yeah so that's for me, sound shaping has quite a lot to do with the mic itself. And then actually, of course, with placing the mic, that's the the actually the, the biggest part in getting good sound is getting the microphone close because you can have the best mic and uh, when you yeah, have the mic miles away, it will not sound good. So, yeah, and this also to do with coloration. So you get the best sound, of course, in placing the mic close and then using decent microphones okay very good i actually said that was going to be the last question but i do have one more i just, it just occurred yeah, sure. to me <laughs> Go ahead. um you did talk about a to d converters and that yeah potentially they can introduce some noise as well what's technically i think what you're measuring when you do the the method that you're using technically you're measuring the the self noise of the preamplifier plus the a to d converter is that correct uh, yeah, that's correct. Because the, I'm measuring the whole signal chain. Um, when you plug in the the uh, 150 ohms resistor into yeah the the recording device, um, the the sound gets preamplified. Or actually, yeah, you, you turn up the preamplifier all the way when you're measuring, and then it gets um, yeah analog to digital converted. That has to be done to get the sound file. So you cannot get around the a to d converter you do have to use it but and that's the that's the reason why you turn up your gain all the way when testing because then the the noise flow of the the preamp is so high that the the noise flow of the a to d converter in comparison is so low that it's completely negligible so yes i'm measuring the uh, the the noise flow of the a to d converter as well in in my ein measurement but it is essentially negligible because it's like 60 decibels lower or something like that so it's n not even there so don't, yeah don't worry about that <laughs> yeah in, in those yeah. cases what we're more concerned with i would assume and i guess and maybe this is a, a question as well is 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 dynamic range of a preamplifier the capability of mm -hmm. dynamic range related to its noise performance um yeah we now now it gets a bit i have to discern now yeah well you have the the noise floor of your preamp which you can have and then you do also have the noise floor of the analog to digital converter and typically you are either limited by the noise floor of your microphone that's that's first of all uh, when you work with like condenser microphones you're typically limited by the noise of the condenser mic or when you use um, dynamic mics, you're usually limited by the noise flow of the um, preamp you have in there in conjunction with the noise of the dynamic mic. And so you're in under normal circumstances, you're not limited by the noise flow of the A to D converter. You're only limited by the A to D converter if you, um, yeah, if you really turn down the gain. So like you record your levels very, very low essentially too low that's uh, yeah and that's the reason why you would turn up your gain so that you're having healthy levels and that's that's a good practice for in in pre yeah in real in real life to do that to have uh, good levels because when you get lower and lower and lower then at some point in time you can run into the noise flow of the a to d converter and that's that's a problem so then you'll be limited by the noise flow of the a to d converter and depending on your equipment you use I, for example, know that the Mix Pre series has extremely good A to D converters. The Zoom F series actually also have very, very good A to D converters. I think they both have like dynamic ranges about 120 dB. 
So that's that's absolutely massive. You can turn down your gain quite a lot and boost it in post without getting any additional noise. You really have to like crank down the gain and then you get into a problem. So usually don't worry about the A to D converter noise at all. It's uh, yeah, it's there. And the dynamic range essentially is only measured at uh, when, when you turn down the gain like all the way. Then then you get the the completely the complete dynamic range of the A to D converter because otherwise, like I said, when your noise floor is limited by the microphone or the preamp, which is above the noise of the A to D converter, then yeah, then that's the lowest sound level you can go before you run into noise, and then that's the limiting factor in terms of um, yeah dynamic range. And usually, if you have like the gain on a setting where you would normally record dialogue or so, you typically have like uh, let's let's have a rough number here maybe 80 80 db or something like that dynamic range and that's that's plenty enough for for dialogue so yeah that's that's not a problem okay very good all right well julian so we uh, we'll put links for your um the the videos that we talked about here you have yeah, two sure. youtube channels as well do you want to just describe those really quickly um yeah actually on my first one i'm a bit more like yeah, my, it's my casual channel. I'm I'm more doing review stuff. I'm uh, doing more tutorials. So yeah, that's that's on that side, and that's also where I uploaded the video comparing the different audio equipment devices with the sound recorders. And then on my second channel, I'm more on the, yeah interested in the technical side because I dig even deeper. And uh, right now, I'm working on a method of measuring like current noise from a preamplifier so that's going to be interesting in the end to have um, it's not really that useful for for many people out there so that's on my ch second channel but it interests me so that's on my second one so first one main channel second one is like ultra technical stuff and if you want to check it out you can go on there okay very good well julian thanks so much for your time today we really appreciate you coming on yeah thank, thank you for your invitation Thank you.